The atypical antidepressants aren't characterized by a single well-defined mechanism, and because of that, the mechanisms are almost never going to be tested. What dictates whether we use them or not depends a lot on their side effects, and for that, I'm going to compare them to the SSRIs, which are our gold standard drug. So the drugs we're going to compare and contrast are bupropion, which is not the same as buspirone, mirtazapine, and trazodone. So the thing that they all have in common is that they're all used to treat major depressive disorder, and you'd think that'd be obvious, but trazodone is actually a lousy antidepressant. It only has antidepressant effects at really high doses, and even then they're not very good ones. None of these are indicated for use in the anxiety spectrum disorders, but bupropion's additionally indicated for use as a smoking aid, and trazodone's so sedating that it's mainly just used for insomnia these days. But like I said, the really high-yield stuff comes from the side effect profile, because that's what determines who you can use these medications on and who you can't. Bupropion and mirtazapine are kind of like yin and yang when it comes to side effects. While bupropion almost acts like a stimulant, mirtazapine promotes both drowsiness and increased appetite. So which one's better? Well, it all depends on how that particular patient experiences depression. Bupropion's benefit, which I alluded to earlier, is that it causes neither sexual dysfunction nor drowsiness. So it may be a great choice in the patients that really don't like either of those effects. Mirtazapine, on the other hand, works really well for a lot of your patients with the classic melancholic depression where they don't sleep and they don't eat. Other than that, bupropion's main side effect is that it lowers the seizure threshold, making it problematic for patients with seizure disorders, and especially for patients who vomit on a regular basis. So watch out for this in your anorexics and your bulimics. Mirtazapine causes dry mouth, which is not usually a huge deal, it's just kind of annoying. And trazodone, which we haven't really talked about, is so sedating that it's mostly just used as a sleep aid. It also has a, another cluster of side effects, including orthostatic hypotension, nausea, and priapism. Now, priapism is the one that everybody remembers. This is actually the least common of all of them, but it's hilarious because you can remember the drug as trazabone. Just watch. Next year, the psych clerkship directors are going to try desperately to re-educate you, but it's not going to work because, you know, y'all have dirty minds. The newer antidepressants, velazidone and vortioxetine, are interesting because they're not only serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but also serotonin partial agonists at certain 5-HT receptors, which, if you think about it, kind of makes them a little bit like a combination of an SSRI and buspirone, especially velazidone. You can remember this because they both conveniently end in O-N-E. For that reason, although both drugs are primarily used for major depressive disorder, Velazidone is also used off-label for generalized anxiety disorder, and seems to have some promising results for comorbid anxiety and depression in early studies. Now, these got FDA approved pretty recently, so psychiatrists are still trying to find their niche in the world of antidepressants. But as far as the drug company suggests, Velazidone's major benefit is to decrease the therapeutic lag associated with SSRIs. No more waiting one month until your depression is treated. It's also got the added benefit of minimal sexual dysfunction, just like buspirone and bupropion. Unfortunately, Headaches are very common with these meds, and the GI symptoms are still prevalent, just like with SSRIs. While vortioxetine is a very new drug, its drug manufacturers began studying its effects on elderly populations pretty early on. Now, this may be partially due to selective research that was performed, but it at least appears to have a cognitive benefit in elderly patients with pseudodementia. Remember what that is? It's a form of reversible cognitive decline in the elderly that's actually secondary to depression. And because it's reversible, treating pseudodementia is a huge deal. Now, whether it actually treats cognitive decline better than any other antidepressant hasn't yet been researched. There have been no head-to-head -head trials yet, but this is at least a proposed theoretical benefit. Vortioxetine is also known for causing sleep disturbance, meaning you get weird dreams when you're taking this medication. This is in addition to a lot of the side effects you'll see with the SSRIs, including sexual dysfunction, weight gain, drowsiness, etc. Both velazidone and vortioxetine can cause serotonin syndrome, just like a lot of the other antidepressants, as well as some anticholinergic effects, but these are pretty rare and not actually specific to this category of drug. Finally, varenicline is on the antidepressant list for some weird reason. It's not actually an antidepressant, it's a smoking cessation aid. Just remember that it can be associated with sleep disturbance. And that wraps it up for the psych section. I hope you like these videos. I know that psych isn't everyone's strongest subject, but hopefully I could make it a little bit more accessible and interesting than you originally envisioned. If you like my psych videos, let me know by giving me a thumbs up down below, and leave a comment if you have the time so we can improve this for next year. Thanks so much for watching. Arjun Iyer, signing out.